Hello, hello. We have made it to lesson 20 of Calling in the One, Seven Weeks to Attract the Love of Your Life. Thanks for joining. I'm Bethany London and I'm looking for my one, my soulmate, and um, was given this book to read and then the challenge of periscoping every day. So we've made it to day 20. Yay. Yay! Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> well, here I am. And today is all about looking at ourselves and our parents. Oh, I was, are you subscribed? I did yesterday. I'm good. I'm good. Oh, yeah, I did one yesterday. Hmm. I don't know. Let me think of what time. Um, I think I did it at probably around four. So, you know, I am on catch though. I am on catch. So it's catching all that I do. And so you can get them there. Um, so if you follow my Twitter at Bethany London, same address, you can, you'll find it. You'll find it. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you guys. Thank you. I have to say, I, I'm really grateful. <laughs> that I am doing this on Periscope and that I'm committed to you guys because it supports me being committed to myself. Cause, oh, thank you. <laughs> because honestly, I this has been such an insane day and I didn't want to do this, but I'm like, no, I gotta do it, I gotta do it. So thank you for holding me accountable. <laughs> hello, turkey. That's funny. Um, hello from turkey. Are you calling me a turkey? I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so today is about cutting the ties that bind us to our family and our parents. I know I'm a goober. And I want to start off with this first quote because I love it and it's so true. Take your life in your own hands and what happens? A terrible thing. There's no one to blame. There's no one to blame. If you take your life in your own hands, there is nobody to blame. Yes, it is. Calling in the One. It's a book we're reading. So we're it's seven weeks, and we're, we're doing it every single day. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Feedback like that when you're telling me that this is resonating with you or tapping the hearts and that this is resonating with you, that that supports me and, like, I want to do, I want to give back. Um, it's by Catherine Woodward Thomas, if you want to buy it. So Calling in the One by Catherine Woodward Thomas, Seven Weeks to Attract the Love of Your Life. In fact, I think she's releasing a new book or, or maybe she already did called Uncoupling, but I'm not ready to read that because that's about breaking up. <laughs> We're, I'm still looking for the one here. So first things first. Um... So she starts off by sharing about this one person, Megan. Ah, thank you. Thank you. So she starts off by this one girl, Megan. And she, Megan basically was raised in, in a family where her mother didn't feel supported by her husband. How confusing. Totally confusing. But basically, Megan married someone and her her mom was made fun of by her father's family. And so she never felt supported. And by being in that kind of environment, next thing you know, it's creating animosity between Megan and her husband because her husband's not supporting her mother. So it's, that's just one. Yes, let's start the lesson. So that's just one, that's one situation. And so that can create uh, animosity between the parents-in-law and your own parents so it can create a whole thing but it's about the fact that we we're on lesson 20 so day 20 it's about the fact that we're taking these issues of other people into our own lives and then creating our own turmoil from it and that's not necessary because it's their problem and we don't need to take it in so hopefully that makes sense um, this I liked this quote too Nothing has a stronger influence psychologically on their children than the unlived life of their parents. That's from analyst Carl Jung. 
Nothing has a stronger influence psychologically on their children than the unlive, unlived life of their parents. And I mean, we covered that the other day with someone and she was forced into dancing. She eventually finally got the courage to stop dancing and it upset her mom so much. But after like six months of arguing, her mom signed up for dance classes and next thing you know, she's competing. I have a YouTube channel. <laughs> Thank you. I do have a YouTube channel. I just don't focus on love. Actually, I do. I do. I focus on love of everyone. Um, yeah, my YouTube channel is Bethany London as well. Everything's Bethany London. You can just Google me and follow me wherever. <laughs> um, anyways, thank you. I appreciate that support. Um, so we got to we got to cut the ties and know that if we're creating frustration in our life, is it coming from us or is it coming from our parents or some other figure? If we want to take it into, yes, yes, yes. So we want to know if, I mean, you, this can be friends. This can be friend. It doesn't have to be calling in the one, but that's what we're reading. Uh, but you can interpret this with your parents. You can do it with friends, business partners. Like where is the frustration? coming from with something? Is it really coming from you or is it coming from a pressure from somebody else? And it's important to uncover that and notice. Oh my God, I love you. That is so cool. So cool. Yay. That makes me feel giddy inside. <laughs> I too am learning. I'm learning as well. Um, so we learn from our parents the risks they never took the communications that were never delivered, uh, the resentments they never forgave can weigh so heavily on us. And then we just absorb that as children. And then we carry it forward until we realize that we need to cut the tie. So that's what this chapter is about. Um, there was another story I wanted to share. Oh yeah, this is so interesting. Yeah. And so, so like that first quote regarding blaming our parents for everything. Once we take our life in our own hands, we have no one to blame. So if I'm frustrated and I haven't accomplished something, let's say like my startup isn't where I'd like it to be yet, then I can't go blaming my parents. I got to take full responsibility and start from that slate. Yes, you can watch the other catch. I have everything on catch. So if you just go to my Twitter feed, Bethany London, um, spell everything, you'll find it. Yeah. Thank you. So, cause there's links on the Twitter feed to the catch site. I don't know what the, that website is. Yeah, no problem. So this was also very interesting. If we look back historically, if we look back historically, people were encouraged to start their careers and have babies and get married at the age of 13 and 14. If we want to go back, you know, a couple hundred years or something, that's when people were getting married and being put into adulthood. And there was a rite of passage, as you'll see with many communities and tribes, you know? So there's this rite of passage. Now it's been extended. So now we become adults and start going after our careers most of the time, you know, in, in general speaking, at the age of 18. We go to college, we don't go to college, we start in a career, we take over our family's business, you know, there's many different things, but this there's been a period extension from the age of 13 to 18, so that's five years. And even though this period of time has been extended for us to become an adult, there is no longer a transition there isn't this rite of passage and training like there was when it was happening if, when we were 13 and 14. So I found that really fascinating. So um, I'm just going to read this. These ceremonial passages that for thousands of years were performed at puberty served to feed power to those entering adulthood in their absence, adult, ab, ab, sorry, in their absence, adolescence became a time of rebellion and revolt for many of us. Our natural instinct is to separate and forge our way through the world it occurred as a sort of mutiny against our elders. <laughs> so completely different than how it used to be. Completely different than how it used to be. So our attempts at forming new families or finding the one 
are consequently handicapped by the incompletions we have with our parents or other authority figures. Does that make sense? Hit, tap the heart if that makes sense. I find it absolutely fascinating. This is, that's really interesting and because it's true when we're teens, now what do we do? We rebel against our, our parents when before, that was the time we were being adults ourselves. So funny. I mean, not funny, but interesting, right? Um, good, glad that's making sense. So, so now, you know, here's a guy, a professional man, his mid thirties, he's looking to meet the one. He's looking to find a woman to be raising a family with. And he's having trouble surrendering to a relationship because his mom was always his one or is his one. And when he moved away from his mom, he felt guilty because he wasn't there by her side. She was a single mother. And now when he's looking for the one, he starts to get excited initially and then he pulls back because he freaks out because he goes into this guilty place to fill a void for his mother who hasn't found her one. And it's not his job to do that. By him separating from his mom, he's gonna empower her, not separating, but giving her the space. He's empowering her to basically to meet her one and to do her own inner work and everything. So that is, the bottom line is we got to own, <laughs> I love you, I love you. The bottom line is we got to own our truth. We got to own who we are. And then even though it might create frustration for those around us, initially it's eventually going to empower them to be their own truth. It's going to eventually empower that. So this lack of stability that this guy, what's his name, Alan, has with his mom is because of his, his mom. And by once he decides to declare his feelings for his girlfriend and tells his mom, and her mom's his mom's upset, he ends up feeling guilty, but he finally, finally just cuts the tie and he's like, look, this is how it is. Mom, I love you. I love this woman and we're gonna move forward. So she, Catherine goes into this. There are two pitfalls for those of us who do not successfully individuate from the families of our childhood. The first one, we may become more fixated in a rebellious adolescent stance, unable to surrender ourselves fully to forming a new family. That's one. We're still stuck in rebellion. I gotta admit, I feel that way sometimes. Cause I was the oldest, I had to be perfect. You know, I didn't have to, but that was the pressure that I felt that I created. That was my void, I had to be the perfect, Miss Moral, ethical child. And then the second here is that we continue to be far too dependent on one or both of our parents, which then makes it difficult for us to formulate our own identity fully. So that's what Ellen was dealing with. Mine would be more the first one, um, rebellious. I was the old, oldest child, I had it so hard. My curfew was like 10 o'clock as senior year in high school. I finally got it to like 11.45 at the end of the year. And all my brothers and sisters were already at like 10 o'clock before they even entered high school, right? So that's my, that's my victim story. But hey, you know, I learned, I, I mean, I got a lot done because I was the oldest, I'd say. Um, here we go into David, this other guy, David. His parents moved here. They were Holocaust survivors. They moved to the United States, penniless. And next thing you know, they have a whole real estate empire. So David's parents built this whole real estate empire. And then David starts taking over the business. He's running, managing all the properties. Every year he's getting a portion of the property in equity. Um, that's how his parents worked him into it, which I kind of, I love this. I love that. But when it came time for him to marry, his parents wanted him to have a prenup. And he didn't feel that he needed a prenup. And his wife really didn't care. She was totally willing to sign the prenup, which is pretty awesome, actually. I'm surprised. And so they decided to do it. for, But it wasn't for them. That's the thing. They got a prenup for his parents, so his parents would feel comfortable with them getting married. And because they did that, 
The next thing you know is he started noticing that he was constantly having to stick up for his mom and the reasons that he had to protect the property, the reasons that his mom, you know, they had started from nothing and they didn't want to feel like things could be taken away from them so quickly because it had been at one point in their life. And so there was a big void there. And he basically started making all these excuses when there was no problem before, absolutely no problem. So he ended up taking this frustration with his parents into his own relationship, which is how we started this conversation off with. And eventually they, him and his wife were fighting like shortly after they got married. And you know, she didn't get anything out of the divorce, but it was important to look at this and see that the stem of the arguments and the frustration had nothing to do with them. It's something that trickled down from the parents into their relationship. And he ended up owning that. And, and it's very important to recognize the difference. So, um, there was something I wanted to read. The ties we have to our parents or authority figures ideally serve as a plant platform from which we launch our lives. So if everything that we are launching from is stemming from bosses, from our parents, from authority figures, maybe teachers, we're crippling ourselves. We're completely crippling ourselves. Yes, exactly. So when we are crippling ourselves, it says those we are hauling around our parents' psyches that desperately need to be released. So we're taking around their own emotions. We don't need their baggage. Come on, we got enough baggage as human beings, right? That we get to cut ties from and, and lose. So as long as we continue to define ourselves in reaction to our parents' needs and expectations, then our judgment is always going to be colored and it's going to be viewed through their lens. So first off, she's saying a lot of first marriages happen because we're filling a void of our parents. And then come the second marriages where we, we start from our own platform. So I thought that was also interesting. Um, I've been married and divorced. And so looking at my first marriage, I would say there definitely was a pressure to get married just because my parents were so hardcore Catholic and I met the guy at 21, I felt guilty to be anything different. Like it, like, of course, if you're with a guy and he's your boyfriend, you're going to get married. Like, that's just how it is. That's how I was raised. I mean, I did, wasn't choosing my own ownership. Um, and I'm not going to blame this on my parents by any means. It was fully my choice to get married and I was having a blast and I was doing the best that I could. Right. We had a lot of fun. Um, so I just know that my upbringing supported basically getting married right away. In fact, oh my God, my mom would hate this if she saw this. She made a bet with our babysitter that I was going to be married by the age of 21. My mom made a bet with our babysitter about that. <laughs> guess who won? The babysitter. So my mom got to buy her a pair of shoes, I guess. Kind of funny. Um, yeah. Anyways. We don't get married at 21 anymore, mom. Come on, come on. Okay, so the bottom line is we need to cut the ties. We gotta cut the ties. In the absence of appropriate rituals, we create our own. Yeah, true, totally. That is one, that is one way of looking at it. There are so many different ways to look at it. Um, so once we create our own rituals, our own come froms, we can create our own rite of passage. So remember that whole thing before of 13 to 18, where now we enter into a state of rebellion instead of a rite of passage to adulthood. We can create our own ritual, our own rite of passage and connect our roots to ourselves, our truth, our truths and our authentic selves and release our own passions and purpose. Mm, yep. Yep. Let's see. That's, that's a lot of pressure. That's definitely a lot of pressure. Um, so by creating our own rituals, we're releasing burdens that no longer serve us, nor do they belong to us and letting go of inappropriate goals that we no longer need to fulfill. And now remember, sometimes when we do this initially, it might create some drama. It may create some frustration, but just know that there's light at the end of the tunnel because once you're honoring your truth, there's nothing but beauty that can be around you. 
So you'll be in flow, 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 flow. Um, I love this quote too by, ooh, I'm not even going to say the name. Sorry, I'm going to butcher it. So the quote though is, don't try to force anything. Let life be a deep let go. Let it go. See God opening millions of flowers every day without forcing the buds. I love that. So beautiful. So individuation is, a, is such of a letting go process, a shredding of our former childhood in the spirit of celebration of our mature, autonomous, and ever, develop, ever developing selves that we are becoming. So that is, that is today's lesson. Did that resonate for any of you guys? Tap the heart or ask a question um, if that message resonated with you. Okay, catch. It's spelled with a K. If any of you guys could spell catch for her or let her know, or just go to Twitter. You know Twitter. Go to twitter.com at or forward slash Bethany London. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and then the homework. Because there's always homework. Yep. Yep, that's where you go. So the homework is to journal on these and answer these questions. She has eight questions, and I'm not going to read them off. I always read them off, and I'm like, are you guys really writing it down? I'm going to screen, I'm going to put the camera on these questions and then screenshot your phone so you get all eight questions. But there's eight questions here to journal about that will support you in recognizing maybe some ties that you have to authority figures or your parents, okay? So get ready to um, to screenshot it. Let's get real clear here. Hey, oh, you're so sweet, thank you. So screenshot this, you guys. Um, who has blank not fully forgiven and for what? What have I not forgiven for? What did blank always want that he or she did not get? What did blank believe that was wrong about his or her life that could not be changed? In what way, if any, did blank overtly or covertly pressure to write where? It is really hard to read. I'm sorry. I'm like shaky holding this. Okay, now I'm two-handing it. Okay, I'm going to count to three. And then I'll read them. Read them. <laughs> My hands are shaky. I get nervous doing these, you guys. <laughs> okay. So if, okay. Oh yeah, if you screenshot it on the internet, maybe it will be bigger. Um, so in what ways, if any, blank, did, did somebody pressure you to what they thought was right or wrong about their own life? Um, what was romantic love like for blank? In what ways, if any, have I been carrying on the burdens, the burden of blank's unfinished business? And what, if anything, could I now give up that did not belong, did not belong to me in the first place? So go through those questions, replay this video if you need to. Um, Cause I know it's, I wish I could just like type it out for you guys. Um, but it's good. Or you go buy the book. You can buy the book if you want to. You can go through it together. It's all about learning from each other, right? Community. Um, and then, of course, there's always a practice in action. And that today is meditating, meditating on your responses and envisioning. The book is Calling in the One, Seven Weeks to Attract the Love of Your Life by Catherine Woodward. Good night. Um... So the bonus action is to sit in a quiet place, darker place probably, and create a safe space for yourself and meditate that you're envisioning this authority figure or this parent in front of you. So envision that they're sitting right in front of you and that you are going to forgive them. Forgive them for any weaknesses that you've absorbed, for the failures that you've had. Uh, forgive them for, the, for your inability to fix that which they believed and had broken in their own lives. Um, forgive them and release them from any further obligation. Through meditation, you don't need to verbally say this because you're doing this for you. You're not doing this necessarily for them. And by 
envisioning that process, things start to shift for you. Um, and it's about taking this into your own hands, taking ownership of the situation. I mean, your parents, do I have a candle lit? Ooh, that could be good. You know, when I light a candle, this is my own thing because I believe in angels and God and spirit guides and all of it. When I light a candle every time, and I don't remember where I got this from, I say the words, only bring in the most highest vibrating powers. That's my thing. Only bring in the most highest vibrating powers because I only want to invite positive energy into my space. Um, so take ownership of your life, do the meditation, release, release all that does not serve you. Um, huh? Is that regarding the candle? Is the huh regarding the candle? I don't know what the lag time is on these. But take ownership of your own life. Release. Okay, the candle. That's a whole nother topic. <laughs> um, I'm just offering it to you guys. If you want to invite, let's say, your higher self. If you believe in something other than yourself. I'll invite my higher self. Like, or God, or angels, or spirit guides, to enter the space to support me in creating my vision. So I only want to invite, though, the highest vibrating. So if you start getting into spirituality, which I am into, and maybe that's what I can start to go through next <laughs> after we finish this book, one thing at a time. Um, yeah, I, I do a lot of, I'm just believing in in things, in, in spirits, and entities, and in a world around me that I can't see. Um, full of love. Full of love. But there's one thing I wanted to say that I'm forgetting. Mm. Anyway. Uh, that's the message. Ownership. Taking your life into your own ownership. Remember, there's no one else to blame. Knowing that they... Oh, that's what I was going to say. Your parents did the best that they knew how. Even if there was abuse... They did the best that they knew how. Maybe they were abused. We don't know. Um, I mean, maybe you do know. But when you come from that space and you offer, you operate in a place of love and forgiveness, you're healing yourself and you're also creating that separation. So that's the lesson for today. Hope you guys liked it. Hope you liked it. Um, tomorrow is lesson 21. Ooh, maybe there'll be candles in this one. It's called a release ceremony. So tomorrow lesson 21 is a release ceremony. So, hmm, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe she has a whole candle ceremony for us. Uh, hmm, better subscribe. <laughs> I don't read these. I read these on the day of. I read it and then I jump on. So, yeah. I thank you guys for joining me today. Subscribe, share this because if this impacted you, I'm sure there's somebody else out there that it could also impact in your community. You never know. And I do believe that we all learn from each other. So feel free to tweet me um, on Twitter and you can follow me. I do have the YouTube video. You can write me, you can contact me that way too, right? Ask me questions. Um, I'm here to support, I'm here to support. So everybody have a beautiful and blessed night, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for the love.